Awesome. Well, welcome everybody to this week's GOCC. Um, before we get started, I will announce or I will say that we're still looking for uh, organizers for next year. So if you're interested, please send an email uh, to any of the organizers or to the um, GOCC email. Um, we've received a few and we would like, we would like uh, more um, and we'll, we'll figure out who, who will organize this in the future so it doesn't die. Um, and also I would like to tell everybody about our community statements. So we follow three kind of big guidelines in, in GOCC. And so the first one is we're all learning. And so, you know, people share their research, but we're not experts on everything. And even though we all share a, a love for combinatorics, um, people tackle it differently. Um, the second one is everyone has to con something to contribute. And so again, we, we come with different experiences and, and knowledge bases. And so please contribute, make use of the chat, ask questions. Cameron, I don't know if you have access or like, can you see the chat? But if, if you can't, um, one of the organizers will kind of jump in and, and ask something uh, at an appropriate time. Yeah, I can, I can keep an eye on the chat. So uh, yeah, don't, awesome. don't worry so about it, Cameron, because if people are just like, sometimes chat's good for like having side conversations if you have a question that doesn't involve interrupting the speaker. So I'd, I'd encourage you just to kind of ignore it and I'll bring it up if there's any important questions. Yeah, so Alex will, will jump in. And then the last one is no one has all the answers, not even the speaker. So um, if we, if, you know, we, we stumble upon something where, where people are asking a lot of questions, you know, the, the speaker can try to, to answer or somebody might have some sort of uh, answer, or, answer in, or we can figure out where to find an answer. Um, and I think that's it for the community uh, statement. And so it is my pleasure to introduce Cameron Wright, who is a graduate student at the University of Washington. Um, and he, and um, Cameron will be talking to us about torso structures on spanning trees. So let's welcome Cameron. Thank you very much. Uh, firstly, I want to thank the organizers for having me here today. And then I also, of course, want to thank everyone in the audience for coming out to hear about torso structures on spanning trees. Um, as mentioned before, I'm Cameron Wright, a graduate student at the University of Washington. Um, and the material in this uh, comes from a project that is joint work with Farbad Shokri, who is a professor at the University of Washington. Um, before I jump into it, can everyone see this uh, little laser pointer thing? OK, nice, wonderful. I plan to use it uh, regularly throughout the, throughout the talk. Um, as mentioned before, feel free to put any questions at any point if anything comes up, um, and I'll gladly address them. Um, it's much better to have people understand the talk than to get through all the material, so uh, I would very much rather be interrupted than be incomprehensible. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so, oh, I also apologize. My, uh, my Zoom or my presentation update thing has this slide feature and I have not been able to figure out a way to do the immediate um, one thing to another. So please forgive me for the slide transitions. So a brief out outline of what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, so you probably read the abstract. Uh, I mentioned that I'm going to discuss torsor structures on spanning trees. These torsor structures are group actions uh, of a certain group on the collection of spanning trees of a graph. So I'll start off today by talking about exactly what kinds of graphs I'm discussing. I'll be talking about ribbon graphs primarily. I'll talk about what that is. Um, I also will define divisors on graphs. Afterwards, I will talk about two dynamical processes called the Bernardi process and the rotor routing process. And these are two um, structures on graphs that allow us to define these torso structures. These are going to allow us to define the group action of what I will call the Picard group on the set of spanning trees. After this, I'll talk about some results that are known uh, in this field, uh, namely results that pertain to planarity. Uh, a, lot of no a lot is known about planar graphs and the relationship between planarity and these torsors. Um, and so I'll just sort of give you a brief overview of those known results. Finally, at the end, I'll talk about non-planar graphs and a conjecture of Baker and Wong that I call the Baker-Wong conjecture. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and get into it. So first I'm gonna let G with a vertex set V and an edge set E be a finite graph with no loops. 
but I want to allow multiple edges. Uh, this is an important distinction. Um, so and when I say multiple edges, I mean, I want to allow there to be repeats of edges. There are multiple parallel edges that have the same endpoints, but no loops. So every edge has two distinct endpoints. A ribbon structure on a graph G is a choice of cyclic ordering of the edges around each vertex. That is to say, if I'm standing at a vertex and I'm looking at one of the edges of that vertex, I know what the next edge is and I know what the previous edge was for every, for every edge there. A graph endowed with a ribbon structure is going to be called a ribbon graph and ribbon graphs are gonna be sort of the main structures that I'm talking about today. One important thing about ribbon graphs, uh, a choice of ribbon structure on a graph is gonna define a surface in which we can imagine the graph to be embedded. Um, and this is going to be an embedding in such a way that no, um, no edges cross on this surface. The surface is not unique in general, but I can choose a surface of minimal genus and that minimal genus is unique. A ribbon graph is gonna be called planar if the associated surface has genus zero. Right? If I can find a minimal genus zero surface in which I can embed this graph with no crossings. Let's have an example of this. So here I have K4, right? our friend K4. Uh, this is a graph I've given two distinct ribbon structures on it. And here in a second, I'll show you the surfaces that they define. So in the left picture on this side, I have, I have every Ribbon structure being the same, it's just the counterclockwise orientation of the plane in which you're watching this talk. The right hand side, uh, three of them are in red. This is, these three red ones are exactly the counterclockwise orientation of the plane. And the blue one is the opposite, right? So I have one disagreement here. So what are the surfaces associated to these? The one on the left is pretty straightforward. Uh, it, you already are looking at it in a plane, you can tell that it can be oriented in the plane. Um, and so we're going to embed it in a sphere, surface of genus zero. The one on the right, however, uh, we're going to embed it in a torus. This is going to be a genus one surface. Um, and the way that I do this embedding, uh, I've picked it so that the counterclockwise orientation of the torus itself, the torus is an orientable surface, the counterclockwise orientation of the torus agrees with the ribbon structure on the graph. So you can see over here by this pink vertex, I actually use the genus, right? I go around the other side. I want to go around the meridian of this torus. Uh, there's a question from Andreas um, about whether the filling in of the vertices matters. Um, it looks like the vertices um, are white on the left and yeah. um, not on the right. Yeah, yeah. I just colored them this way in order to sort of give uh, an illustration of which vertex goes where in uh, this picture. So for example, this pink vertex is exactly this vertex right here. The fact that the orientation disagrees is what's going to tell me that I have to go around the torus in this way. So the coloring is purely for, purely for being clear about which vertex is which. In general, these are not planar, these are not colored graphs that I'm dealing with. Now let's talk about divisors a little bit. A uh, divisor on a graph G is gonna be an element of the free abelian group with generators vertices of G. I can think about this as an integer linear combination of vertices. And usually in this talk, I will talk about them like they are column vectors in a vector space of dimension equal to the number of vertices. The collection of all divisors forms a group Right. This is a lattice and a vector space, and we can just add things together. Uh, and the group of all divisors will be denoted by div of G. If I take a given divisor and I add up all of its components, I get an integer. That integer is the degree of the divisor. The degree is the sum of its components. And the collection of divisors of degree D is going to be denoted div D of G. So this little superscript D is going to tell me how many what the total sum of the components is. Um, one nice way to think about this uh, is that if I have a divisor with certain integers on all the vertices, then I want to think of a certain number of chips being placed on those vertices. Um, 
And this is actually exactly the perspective taken by the field of chip firing. Um, but I don't want to talk too much about chip firing, so we'll just sort of take divisors from here and go forward. Um, I apologize, actually, just, just one second real quick. My apologies, my laundry room is right outside my room and I had to stop someone from doing laundry. <laughs> um, where was I? So uh, I was talking about the degree of divisors. Divisors of degree zero form a subgroup that I'm gonna be calling div zero of G. In general, I wanna point out that div D of G is not a group. If I have two divisors of degree D and I add them together, I'll get a divisor of degree two D but div zero actually is a group and it's an important, uh, an important group for us today. A more important group for us is gonna be called the Picard group of G. Uh, this is a group that is referred to by many people in many different fields. You may have heard it referred to as the Sandpile group or the critical group of the graph. Also maybe the Jacobian group of the graph. A lot of people talk about this and they like to call it different things for some reason. In order to define the Picard group, I have to talk about the combinatorial Laplacian of the graph. This is a matrix, a vertices by vertices many matrix with entries delta vi comma vj, such that the diagonal, or i equals j, the diagonal is going to be the negative of the degree of the vertex. And the off diagonal entries are just going to be the number of edges between those two vertices. This is going to give me my my combinatorial Laplacian, which I will call delta. Brief example of this. Suppose that I have this graph down here, right? And I have two parallel edges right here. If I define the Laplacian of this graph, I get the following matrix. Um, here, I have implicitly ordered the vertices. I'll have my first vertex in the top left, second in the top right, third in the bottom left, and fourth in the bottom right. So if we look at this, I hope you agree that I've constructed this combinatorial Laplacian appropriately. I have the degree of the vertex along the diagonal, or the negative of the degree, and the off-diagonal entries are exactly the number of edges between the two vertices. So why do I care about the combinatorial Laplacian? In order to answer that question, I'm going to first talk about a different set. I'm going to let m of g be the collection of integer-valued functions on the vertex set. So this is going to take an, an element of M is going to take in a vertex, take in all the vertices, and tell you how many chips are on those vertices. As a set, this is actually the same thing as the collection of divisors on the graph, but I've called it a different thing because we're going to think about it a little bit differently in this context. I'm going to define a collection of divisors called principal divisors on graphs. A principal divisor is of the form delta f, where delta is my combinatorial Laplacian, um, for some f in m of g. Now, since f is integer valued, I can think about delta f as a linear combination of the columns of the combinatorial Laplacian. Each column of the combinatorial Laplacian has columns m0, so these are all going to be degree 0 divisors, namely the group print of G is going to be a subgroup of div zero of G. I'm going to say that two divisors D and D prime of a given degree are going to be linearly equivalent if their difference is in the principal divisors. This is going to give me a collection of linear equivalence classes in every degree. Every degree is going to be partitioned into these classes. So why do I care about principal divisors? Because they allow me to define my Picard group. The Picard group is going to be the div, the div zero of G mod print of G. This is the degree zero divisors modulo linear equivalence. So an element of pick zero of G is a linear equivalence class of divisors. Let's give an example of this real quick so we don't uh, just do a lot of words and not many pictures. I like pictures a lot, so I've included a lot of them here. I hope you're okay with that. Um, 
So this is the graph that we had in our previous example, right? We have our double edges at the top. Uh, everything else just looks like a kite. This is the same matrix delta as beforehand. I'm going to have a divisor, D, minus 1, 2, 3, 0. That's minus 1, 2, 3, 0. Oops, didn't update for a second. I'm also going to give you a function f. This is an element of m of g. And it's 0, 0, 1, minus 1. So I can think about this as the third column minus the fourth column. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to apply delta to f, and I'm going to add it to d, and I'm going to get a new divisor. These divisors are going to be linearly equivalent. If I apply delta to f, I get the following. 1, 0, minus 4, comma 3. And then if I add this to my divisor D, I'm going to get a new divisor. So if I have minus 1, 2, 3, and 0, and I add to it delta F, I'm going to get 0, 2, minus 4 goes to minus 1, and 3 here. Okay. How can I think about this? Uh, I've been adding and subtracting these columns of the Laplacian. Uh, when I add, a column of the Laplacian, what I'm actually doing is I'm performing a chip firing move. Um, a chip firing move says, OK, if I fire this third column, I'm going to add it here. I'm going to take all of the things here, right? all of the chips here. I'm going to send one outwards from it along each edge. And when I subtract a column, I'm going to perform a different colored chip firing move. Uh, I'll do it in purple here. That's going to say, OK, in my fourth vertex, I'm going to borrow chips from all of my neighbors. So I'll take one from here, and I'll take one from here. OK, hopefully this is clear. Now I have to talk about a special collection of divisors called break divisors. So let t be a spanning tree. Then a break divisor is an integer linear combination of endpoints of edges outside of the tree. That is to say, for every edge outside of the tree, I'm going to pick one of the endpoints. So I'm going to put a chip there. The divisor that I get this way is going to be a break divisor for this for the tree T. A given tree is going to have a bunch of different break divisors, uh, but the important thing is that for every tree, I can obtain at least one break divisor. Okay. Um, the degree of a break divisor is always the combinatorial genus of the graph. Um, this is also the dimension of the first homology, if you like to think about it that way. Um, I'm going to refer to it as G for the remainder of the talk. Uh, we're going to denote this set of all break divisors by B of G. A brief example of this. So suppose here I have this spanning tree. It's in the shape of a Z. There are two edges outside of the spanning tree. So I want to pick one vertex that's an endpoint of each of these edges. And I want to have that be my divisor, my break divisor. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pick this one and this one. And then I get the following break divisor, which is just 1, 1, 0, 0. It's a degree 2 divisor. And sure enough, this graph has um, genus 2. So I have to talk for a second about some foundational facts just to sort of start putting these things together for us. Um, firstly, I'm going to let t of g, curly t of g, this is the set of all spanning trees. Then first fact, for every integer d, the cardinality of the Picard group is equal to the number of degree d equivalence classes. I didn't define this object, but it's just linear equivalence classes in degree d. And that's going to be equal to the number of spanning trees. In particular, the number of elements of the Picard group is equal to the number of spanning trees. This is the relationship that will give us our torso structures for, for the later portions. Second fact, there is a natural regular action of pick 0 on pick D for all D. When I say regular action, I mean simply transitive group action. Right? There's an equality in cardinality, and it's going to act injectively on this thing. Each element of the Picard group is going to be a different permutation of the linear equivalence classes in degree d. Finally, 
each linear equivalence class in the degree G divisors, genus degree divisors, contains a unique break divisor. So here, what that tells me is that if I want to represent a linear equivalence class, if I want to represent an equivalence class in degree G, I'm going to pick a break divisor to do that. There are exactly spanning tree many break divisors. This is what's going to allow me to define one of my two actions in just a second. This first action is derived from something called the Bernardi process. Now the setting uh, up to this point, I've been talking just about graphs. Now I want to talk about ribbon graphs. So now I will give it a ribbon structure and orientation of edges about each vertex. There's a family of bijections, beta QE, that take in um, a spanning tree and spit out an, uh, oh, this is supposed to be a G right here. So it'll take in a spanning tree and it'll spit out a linear equivalence class in degree G. Uh, and this is gonna be parameterized by pairs Q comma E where Q is a vertex and E is an edge incident to that vertex. A uh, quick example of this. Um, so here's my spanning tree that I wanna care about. This is a backwards N. I have my distinguished vertex here and I have my edge here. So the Bernardi process actually is an algorithm that is a little bit tricky to define, but more or less, we just need an intuitive understanding of what this thing does. So I'm gonna just show you by example what this thing is. If I'm standing at the vertex Q, I wanna start by looking across the edge E at the other vertex. What I'm gonna do ultimately is I'm gonna walk around this whole graph and I'm gonna come back to where I'm standing. How do I know where to walk? I'm looking across the edge E. Either it's in the spanning tree, in which case I'm gonna walk across it to the other side, or it's not in the spanning tree. If it's not in the spanning tree, like, like this situation, I am not gonna walk across it. I'm gonna look at the next edge in the ribbon structure. And I'm gonna place a chip where I'm standing. Okay, I only place a chip if I haven't looked at that if I haven't stood on the other side. So when I'm standing here and I look across an edge that's not in the spanning tree, I say, have I been over there? If I've been over there, I don't place the chip here. So what does this do? I start here and I'm looking at E. It's not in the spanning tree, I ignore it. I go to the next edge, walk across it, down to here. And I look at the next edge in the spanning tree, or sorry, the next edge in the ribbon structure. It's not in the spanning tree. Then I find another one, I walk around it, Etc. I end up performing this tour of the graph and I come back. I just walk all the way around the spanning tree. So where are the chips that I put for here, right? First, I was standing here and I saw an edge that wasn't in the spanning tree. I'm gonna place a, a chip there. I went down to the bottom left vertex and then I saw another edge that was not in the spanning tree. So I'm gonna place a chip here and then the other two, okay, well, I see the edge that's not in the spanning tree, but I'm not gonna place a chip because I've been on the other side. Hey, we have a quick question from Galen, um, uh, which maybe you can explain a little more about, uh, she's asking about what is G in the definition of beta? So maybe you can say where this combinatorial genus comes from. Yeah, so the G, the combinatorial genus, as it was mentioned, uh, is the number of edges outside of any spanning tree. So every spanning tree of the graph is, yeah, okay, nice. Good, nice. So I have this break divide, or this divisor, right? Uh, it turns out that this is a break divisor, right? For every edge that's outside of the graph, I've placed a unique chip. So I end up with exactly this divisor right here. I end up with one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, which is one, zero, one, zero. Now, this is going to be the image of the spanning tree under this, this bijection, beta QE. And this is going to be a linear equivalence class in degree G. Now, I can use this to define my first group action. Baker and Wong showed that each bijection, beta QE, gives rise to an action, beta Q, that allows the Picard group to act on the set of spanning trees in a way that is independent of the edge E. 
And the subscript here, right? I only have my little Q now. I've dropped the E is because I don't care about the E anymore. It's going to be the same action regardless of the initial edge. So for a fixed vertex Q, I'm going to pick some edge. It doesn't matter which one, but I'm going to pick one of them. And that's going to be my initial data, Q comma E. Then I can define the action of a divisor class of the, of the Picard group, right? An element of the Picard group acts in the following way. I take my spanning tree T, I apply beta to it. I get an equivalence class in degree G. I'm going to translate that via my element of the Picard group. I'll get another equivalence class in degree G. And then I'm going to do the inverse bijection from beforehand. And I'll get another spanning tree. I start with a spanning tree. I go up to pick G, over to pick G, and back to a spanning tree. OK. This is important, so I'm going to pause here for a second. Is this, is this clear? Are, are the two spanning trees you get on both sides, are they the same? So they will not be the same in general. This is actually how we're going to define our action. So sometimes it might be the case that the Picard group acts trivially, which is going to mean that for every spanning tree, I can do this process, tree, divisor, divisor, tree, and get the same tree back. But usually there'll be different trees. And that, I guess, is where the interesting part of this action comes from. So let's see exactly how this works. I have my spanning tree. Uh, this one looks like a Z. This is my Z spanning tree. And I have a divisor, which is going to be 1, 0, 0, minus 1. 1, 0, 0, minus 1. First thing I have to do, if I use, I want to use this divisor to get another spanning tree, is what I'm trying to do. So the first thing that I have to do is perform a Bernardi tour. Right? I start with Q comma E. And then I walk all the way around the graph. OK, where did I deposit my chips? I've deposited one chip here. And I deposited one chip here. So I get the break divisor 0, 0, 1, 1. OK, I translate now by the divisor class D. So that's, that is to say, I'm just going to add D to this divisor. And then look at that, that equivalence class. I get the equivalence class of the divisor 1010. Right? I just added these two vectors together. And I'm saying, OK, that's in a given equivalence class. Now what I have to do is invert the Bernardi bijection. I am not going to tell you how to do that, because that is a tricky business. So, But I, what, I, what I will say is that this divisor class here actually is convenient. And um, it's almost like somebody chose it this way. But this is actually the break divisor that we got from the previous example. Right? If we started here, we walked around this way. Where do we place our chips? We did one right here, we did zero over here, we did one right here, and zero over here. That is, we get one, zero, one, zero. This divisor takes the Z spanning tree to the backwards N spanning tree. Now, time for the second action. Second action is derived from a different process. Uh, sorry for all these definitions, but these are, these are sort of the main things. So it's important to sort of get them straight in order to talk about these results. The rotor routing process is going to give us our second action. So what is the rotor routing process? Again, we're going to fix a river graph, right? So this is a graph with an ordering of, of all the vertices or of the edges around each vertex. A rotor function on a ribbon graph uh, with a distinguished vertex Q is going to be a function that assigns to every vertex an edge incident to that vertex. Think about it as the rotor at that vertex. So for every vertex that's not Q, I have an outgoing direction. That's what this thing is. A rotor configuration is a pair sigma comma V. So that is to say I have a rotor function. And I have a distinguished ver another vertex that I'm going to say, OK, that's where my chip is. I have a chip moving around this graph. 
I'll give an example of this in a second because it's kind of hard to picture. But before I do that, I'll comment on this. The rotor routing process, uh, rotor routing process is a dynamical system on the rotor configurations. I'm going to get one rotor configuration after another, and I'm going to do this, this finitely many times, and then I'm going to terminate the process. So how does one step of this dynamical system go? One iteration is going to take a rotor configuration sigma comma v to another sigma prime comma w. What is the rotor function sigma prime? So my chip was at v, right? Everywhere outside of v, I'm not going to do anything. It's going to be the same, same rotor. What happens at v? I'm going to take the successor of sigma of x. So if, if I'm the vertex that has the chip, I have an outgoing rotor. I'm going to shift it to the next one in the ribbon structure. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw the chip across to my friend at that vertex. So w is going to be the other endpoint of the successor of v. Let's see what this looks like. Suppose I have the following k4. Um, here, the ribbon structure is just counterclockwise orientation of the plane. My distinguished vertex is going to be this box right here. The chip is at the dark vertex up here. If I have the following rotor configuration, a, this one points out here, this one points out to here, this one points out to here, then what do I do? I apply my first iteration. The vertex at the chip rotates. My rotor is now going to be here. And I'm going to throw the chip to that person. I get the following configuration. What happens next? OK, they see that their rotor is pointing out this way. They're going to rotate over to here, and they're going to throw it to the person standing in the box. We end up with this configuration. Now the chip has reached the box, and I'm going to say, nice, we're done. This is the end of the process. So what I've done is I've started with this configuration. And I've ended with this configuration. One thing to note about this, the one at the far left is a spanning tree of the graph. If I take just the rotors on the far right, if I look at just the rotors, I get another spanning tree of the graph. This is not a coincidence. So let me tell you about the rotor routing action, and then I'll tell you why that's not a coincidence. The rotor routing action says, OK, fix a vertex cube. I want to say first point out that the degree zero divisors are generated by divisors of the form v minus q, or v is any other vertex of the graph. In order to define this action, I'm going to define the action of these generators. And then I'm going to extend this uh, in a nice way. Given a pair v minus q comma t, or t is a spanning tree, I can get a rotor function by orienting all the edges of t towards q. For any two vertices in the graph, there's going to be a unique path inside the spanning tree that connects the two vertices. They're going to be oriented from, a, from every vertex that's not distinguished to the vertex q. That's how this is going to point. This is exactly the picture that was on the left in the last slide. Beginning from rotor configuration sigma t comma v, I'm going to do rotor routing over and over again until I eventually reach some configuration where the chip lands at q. This is guaranteed to happen. That's a theorem. Moreover, it's guaranteed that the rotor configuration at the end is a spanning tree. That's another theorem. This is going to allow me to use my generators and get from one spanning tree to another spanning tree. But this is these are these are divisors, right? These are not pick zero elements. Turns out that this actually descends in a well-defined way to an action of the Picard group. So if two divisors are linearly equivalent, they're going to induce the same action on the spanning trees. This is going to give me exactly my second action, my rotor routing action. Uh, and I'm going to call it rho sub q for my base point vertex, where the box is. OK. Talked an awful lot. Let's look exactly at what this does. I'm going to take this spanning tree, this Z spanning tree, and I'm going to use on it the divisor 1, 0, 0, minus 1. And I'm going to have this 
as my distinguished vertex, the minus one coordinate vertex. So first thing, I got to get my rotor configuration. I just put my chip at the one coordinate, and I orient everything towards my distinguished vertex. First, I shift the rotor configuration, and then I throw the chip. Second, I shift the rotor configuration, and I throw the chip. Now these two are pointing at each other. Oh, now these two are pointing at each other. That's fine. Uh, Finally, this one is going to shift rotor configuration and throw the chip, and that's going to terminate the process right here. Okay, so I started with the Z spanning tree, and I ended up with the backwards N spanning tree. Let's talk a little bit about what these things do for us. I'm going to talk about the relationship between these actions and planarity of the graph, of the ribbon graph. So let G be a ribbon graph. Recall that G is planar if and only if the ribbon structure defines a genus zero surface. If and only if I can draw this thing on a sphere so that the orientation agrees with counterclockwise on the sphere. A theorem that was proven by uh, Chan, Church, and Grochow in 2014 states that the rotor routing action, rho sub Q of the Picard group is independent of the base point Q if and only if G is a planar ribbon graph. So I can have any distinguished vertex, I'm gonna get the same action. Another theorem also proven in 2014 by Baker and Wong states that the Bernardi action beta sub Q is independent of the base point Q if and only if G is a planar ribbon graph. The same theorem, different Greek letter. So it turns out actually that it's a little bit stronger than this. Uh, we don't just have this coincidence between them both being independent. We actually have that these rotors are the same rotor. If, or sorry, that these torsors are the same torsor structure. If I have a planar ribbon graph, then rho is equal to beta, right? They're truly the same group actions. An example of this in both of the examples for rotor routing and for Bernardi earlier, I had the Z graph to start with, and then I performed, I had my divisor, which was one, zero, zero, minus one. I used that on both of them. And in both cases, I got the backwards N spanning tree, right? These are different base points, but they're gonna actually be the same action. This is just an instance of this, of this theorem. Okay, so, this is really nice stuff involving planarity, but what happens for non-planar ribbon graphs when I get at least one genus in the surface? If G is a non-planar ribbon graph, Baker and Wong conjectured that there exists a vertex VQ such that rho Q is not equal to beta Q. An important addendum to this conjecture actually is that here they add the condition that G have no multiple edges. Now I made a big deal at the beginning about we want to allow multiple edges that's different than what's going on in this conjecture. Um, but nonetheless, this conjecture stands for graphs with no multiple edges. Um, sure enough, this was a conjecture for a long time, uh, about six and a half, seven years, something like that. Uh, turns out now, it's actually a theorem uh, proven by Farbad Chokri and myself. Um, so the Baker-Wong conjecture is true. And it turns out that this is not a unique theorem. Uh, I was told a couple of days ago that a preprint went up on archive last week that also has this theorem in it. So props to those authors. <laughs> um, but yes, nonetheless, the Baker one conjecture is true for graphs with no multiple edges. Do you, do you know if, uh, I don't know if you've looked at in, like deep look into that preprint, but are the methods uh, completely different or? Um, I haven't looked very closely at it, but I looked at the figures and I think based on the figures that they found the same thing that I did. <laughs> well, you can say you did it first. <laughs> well, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> we definitely did it independently. That much is good. <laughs> so uh, moving on from here, um, I want to talk a little bit more about non-planar ribbon graphs. Uh, in order to do this, I have to talk about two things, non-separating cycles and these things called witnesses. Now, given a non-planar ribbon graph, there necessarily exists a non-separating cycle C. 
When I say a non-separating cycle, I mean that when we get the surface out of the ribbon graph, I can cut along the cycle and the surface remains connected. That's a non-separating cycle. Further, in order for this to have defined a positive genus surface, there has to exist a path such that the first edge of the path is on the left of the cycle and the last edge of the path is on the right of the cycle. Right, I ran around a hole is how this, what this effectively is saying. Uh, such a path is called a witness path for the cycle. So let's have a picture of this because it's easier than words. Here I have uh, two graphs drawn on the torus. So here I've used the identification diagram for the torus. Uh, top goes to bottom and left goes to right. So the non-separating cycle here is drawn in blue in both of these examples. Right? It's the one going around the meridian of the torus. In the left, I have this path that goes down this way, comes back in this way, leaves from the left, comes back on the right. This is a witness path. Similarly, over here, leaves on the left, comes back on the right, a witness path. I want to talk about specific kinds of witnesses, what I'm going to call a proper witness. Uh, so in a non-planar ribbon graph, suppose there's a non-separating cycle such that there's a witness path having distinct endpoints. Right? I left from one place and I come back another place. Then the pair C comma P is going to be called a proper witness pair. Okay. An example, this graph on the left has a proper witness pair. This graph on the right does not have a proper witness pair. Why do I care about proper witnesses? So turns out that if G is a non-planar ribbon graph admitting a proper witness pair, then there necessarily exists a vertex Q such that rho Q is not equal to beta sub Q. If there's a proper witness pair in this graph, I can guarantee that these, these torsos are not the same thing. Perhaps more importantly, in, in this proposition, this is nothing about the number of edges. So this is independent of multiple edges or not, right? This works for non-planar ribbon graphs with multiple edges as well. Um, and actually, one nice thing that we were able to find as well is that this implies that if G is a non-planar graph endowed with a ribbon structure, then necessarily the torsos disagree. So this is a graph that has as a minor either a K5 or a K33, right? It's a non-planar graph. We were able to show that no matter what the ribbon structure is that you put on it, there is going to be a vertex such that these torsos disagree. Again, this is agnostic to the presence or absence of multiple edges. So this is kind of neat. You can have a very complicated multiple edge non-planar graph and I, I'm going to tell you, no matter how you embed it in a surface, I'm going to go ahead and guarantee that there exists a vertex such that these torsos are not the same. So can you repeat, if you, if you have a graph that can be embedded planarly, mm -hmm. but you choose a non-planar embedding, can you prove it in that case also? Um, or is that where you needed the no double edges? Um, so if there's a proper witness pair, then in that case, I can guarantee. So proper witness pair doesn't care about number of edges at all. OK. And yeah, what, what, did, what was the condition for when there does exist a proper witness pair again? Um, so there exists a proper witness pair for every non-planar graph if you put a ribbon structure on it. Does that answer your question? Yeah, but, so, but not necessarily for a planar graph that you happen to choose a non-planar ribbon structure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're going to actually see an example of that here in just okay. a couple of slides. Yeah. Um, so I have, this goes until 2 p.m. Eastern time, correct? So I have like 11 minutes. Yeah, it's, it's not super strict exactly when it ends, but some people might need to leave for 2 o'clock. OK. Well. In that case, I think I do have time to tell you a little bit about this proof. Um, so I want to I want to tell you briefly how it is that we say, okay, here's a planar, here's a proper witness pair. I'm going to tell you where they disagree. I'm going to describe to you how this happens. 
So recall the definition of the Bernardi action, right? Fix a vertex Q and let E be an edge incident to Q. For divisor class D in the Picard group, the Bernardi action is defined via this formula, right? I do a Bernardi bijection. I translate by my divisor class, and then I do the inverse function to get back another spanning tree. In order to show that beta sub Q is not equal to rho sub Q, it's enough to find some spanning tree such that beta Q of DT is not equal to rho Q of DT. It's going to tell us that some group element has different images under this homomorphism into the permutation group. They're not the same homomorphism is what this means. So how can I manipulate this so it's a little bit nicer to work with? Well, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of this inverse function thing, because I already told you that this is not a nice algorithm. So let's just apply it to both sides. And that what we want to show is that d plus beta qe of t is distinct from beta qe of this thing. So another thing that's kind of complicated is this D. I don't really want to be working with complicated divisors D or complicated divisor classes D. So I'm going to use Z minus Q instead, because I just talked about the rotor routing action for uh, divisors of this form. So we'll just stick to that and it'll be, it'll be good for us. So if I let T prime be the image of T under the rotor routing action with the z minus q thing. That is to say, I start with t, I put a vertex at z, or sorry, I put a chip at z, and I want to get my chip to q. That's what I'm saying. So I get the new spanning tree t prime. What we want to see is that z minus q plus beta qe of t is distinct from beta qe of t prime. This is exactly the same line that I wrote on the previous thing. There are a lot of symbols in this particular thing, but what this is saying is that I want to do the Bernardi process to two different trees. I get two break divisors. One of the break divisors, I'm going to translate by this divisor, and I want to check if those things are the same equivalence class or not. So what I have to do in order to find this inequality is to pick Q, Z, and T appropriately. Here's a picture of how I pick Q, Z, and E, the edge that's used in the Bernardi bijection. Now, for the sake of simplicity, I have only a genus one surface. It might be the case that there are a bunch of other holes in this thing. It might be the case that there's a lot of other stuff going on in this graph. But at the end of the day, if there's a proper witness pair, then I have this picture in it. The proof relies just on this picture. So I'm going to work with just this graph on this torus. Proper witness pair is in blue. There might be a bunch of other vertices, but the only vertices that I care about are Z and Q and these other two vertices over here. How do I get my spanning tree? I'm going to do the following. I'm going to remove E. I'm going to take the whole cycle, add that to the spanning tree. I'm going to look at the whole witness path, and I'm going to throw out this edge. So I'm lacking this edge, and I'm lacking this edge. This is going to give me the following orientation. I'll draw a couple of little arrows. This goes this way. These go around here. These go around here. These go down and up to there. This is the orientation of the rotor configuration. OK, so what happens when I use rotor routing on this? When I apply z minus q, this rotor is just going to shift to this vertex. It's going to fire to q, and I'm going to be done. That's it. That's the whole rotor routing process. So that is to say, I have my tree T over here. I apply rotor routing to it. I get my tree T prime. The only difference is this edge versus this edge. So what does the Bernardi process do to this? I'm going to draw it in purple for both of these graphs. So I'm starting with Q comma E. So the edge that I really care about 
the edge that I'm starting with is this edge right here. So for the graph T, I do the following. I go over, around on this side, around to the other side. And I'm going to do this. I hope you agree. I cut I cut two edges, right? So I'm going to put two chips. I'm going to put one of my chips right here on Q. And I'm going to put one of my chips over here on this side. What happens in T prime? T prime, I start with the same vertex, start with the same edge. Go around this way. So what did I do? This time I'm going to put my chip at Z, one of these for, for one of these edges that I cut. And well, this time I traversed these two arms of the witness pair in the opposite order. So I put my other chip over here. Okay. Do these pictures make sense? So what does this do for me? This gives me the following break divisors, right? If I assume that this is all that's in this graph, I get the following break divisors. I get a, a one and a zero. On the other hand, I get a zero and a one. I get a one and a zero. On the other hand, I get a zero and a one. These are different divisors. What happens now if I translate by Z minus Q? If I translate by Z minus Q, this becomes a zero. This becomes a one, right? So now these divisors agree over here and they disagree over here. Moreover, this is an unsubstantiated claim that I'm just gonna tell you is true. These are both break divisors. They're break divisors and they definitely disagree over here. That means they're different linear equivalence classes. That means that this tree was mapped to two different places. This is exactly how this proof goes. There's more complicated stuff if there's more things in the graph, but at the end of the day, it boils down to exactly this observation. And I thought that this was just so cool when I found it in the first place. Cause like at the end of the day, it's just these two pictures. It's just like, you have a donut, you got, a, you got some loops on your donut and then you're just gonna run around, you're just tracing. It made me feel like a kindergartner. And I was like, wow, this is a theorem. Pretty neat, I liked it a lot. Um, so yeah, that's, a, that's effectively how this uh, proper witness proof goes. So let's just look back real quick at everything that we've seen today. So, oh, I, I told you that I was going to give you this counter example. It'll only take a second. So for a non-planar ribbon graph with multiple edges, you can make no guarantees about the agreement or disagreement of the Bernardi and rotor writing torsors. So if I don't have a proper witness, that is to say, I have a thing that looks like this, right? They go to the same place. You can make no guarantees. Um, in particular, the following graph satisfies row Q equals beta Q for all vertices Q. What's the ribbon structure? This is the ribbon structure. This is exactly the picture that I just drew for you. It's exactly this picture. It doesn't have, it doesn't have a proper witness. It's certainly a planar graph. It's a non-planar ribbon graph, and it turns out okay. I, the conjecture fails for this case. So if multiple edges are allowed, it certainly is the case that you need a proper witness. As I mentioned before, though, if you have a non-planar ribbon graph with no multiple edges, they're definitely different. So now, in conclusion, what can I say? First, 
the Baker Wong conjecture is true. For non-planar ribbon graphs without multiple edges or loops, there is a vertex for which the two torsors disagree. Second, for non-planar ribbon graphs with or without multiple edges, a proper witness pair ensures that they disagree. Third, in the absence of a proper witness, I can't tell you anything for sure. <laughs> Uh, they might agree, they might disagree. Uh, I've checked a lot of examples. Sometimes, they, sometimes they're the same and sometimes they're not. Uh, but at any rate, I hope that you've enjoyed the stuff that I've been talking about over the course of the day today. And I hope that you liked my pictures. Thank you very much for listening. Awesome, let's thank Cameron. Very nice talk. Does anybody have questions for Cameron? Uh, so I guess this, I this oh, um, well, I'll, I'll go first and then the other person. Um, so you have this idea of, of for um, uh, these, to tell whether or not a graph is planar, you have, you can look for these witnesses, at least um, without the ribbon structure looking at planarity. But is there anything that can, any property that you know of that can kind of determine what the genus of the graph is beyond whether or not it's planar? So that I don't know. Um, somebody asked me this question the other day and I also did not have an answer for them. The closest thing that I can give you is upper bounds. Like um, certainly if you can embed the graph into a genus, in, into a surface of a given genus, certainly it's the case that the genus of the graph, the combinatorial genus of the graph is, at most one less than the genus of the surface. So I'll, I'll do some symbols here. If you have a graph G, the ribbon structure that gives you a surface S, um, the genus G uh, is less than or equal to the genus of S, which I guess I'll do this way, minus one. Beyond that, I'm not, I'm not really sure. Uh, it's kind of hard to say. I think, I suspect that in order to answer that question, uh, you have to dig a little bit more into the topology of the situation. Um, I mentioned that from a ribbon graph, you get a surface, but I didn't say how effectively you just want to take a bunch of disks. You, you take a geometric realization of the graph, take a bunch of disks and glue them together um, in such a way that like, if I have an edge, or sorry, a vertex with two edges that are adjacent, then I end up putting a disk right here. Um, so certainly it's the case that the genus of the graph G, um, the combinatorial genus is going to tell you how many of these disks you need in the first place. Um, but that's also sort of up to the ribbon structure itself. So does that kind of help? And Galen, you had a question? My question was much more vague, which was just um, this, is, this is more of a background question of like, maybe you know, maybe you don't. Is there some physical phenomenon that this rotor rooting process models other than having like one chip flow through the system? Um, that's an awesome question. Um, and despite the fact that it's vague, it is a question that I have wondered myself. And the answer is yes, this is, this is reflective of um, physical phenomena. So in chip firing, one of the main reasons that people started looking at chip firing in the first place was from the perspective of statistical mechanics, which wanted to see, I guess, I said that this group is also called the sand pile group. Uh, if you want to start with a lattice and you put a bunch of pieces of sand on the different vertices of the lattice, if you get to a certain height, maybe, okay, my, my pile of sand is gonna get unstable. I'm gonna fall and I'm gonna distribute sand to the things around it. Um, so that sort of is the motivating example behind chip firing. And you can actually see that similarity a lot closer in chip firing than in rotor routing. But your question was about rotor routing. Um, so what rotor routing does, um, it was proven by a collection of like five different authors, including um, Holroyd, Prop, Wilson, Mazaros, Perez. That's five. I think, I think that was everyone. Anyway, uh, Mazaros. They showed that 
rotor routing is a deterministic approximation of the statistical mechanics phenomenon. So if you start on a lattice and you put just one piece of sand at the origin, say, like in a 2D integer lattice, uh, and you just you have a random distribution of rotors across this whole thing, and you just run rotor routing, what they proved is that at a long time, I guess as t goes to infinity, the distribution of sand is the same as the distribution of sand in chip firing. So if you have just one piece of sand that you move around on this lattice, the amount of time that it spends in a given vertex is going to be the same as the amount of sand that ends up in infinity if you just keep dropping sand everywhere. Um, this also can be used, uh, I looked a little bit at this, but I haven't, haven't gone very far in it. It also can be used to think about networks of chemical reactions. Um, so a lot of times in chemical reaction network theory, you have vertices of a graph and those represent like collections of like, maybe I have two hydrogens and an oxygen. Um, and then there's an arrow that says, okay, from my two hydrogens and an oxygen, I have an arrow to become one H2O. Um, so that corresponds to one, one performance of that reaction, one iteration of that reaction corresponds to like a chip moving from the two H and one O vertex to the H2O vertex. It's kind of difficult though, because um, chemical reactions are happening. They're gonna happen all over the graph. Um, so it's kind of this halfway point between rotor routing and chip firing. Chip firing wants to distribute to every adjacent vertex. Rotor routing only cares about one thing happening at a time. In chemical reactions, there are a bunch of different one things happening at the same time. Hey, Cameron, that was a great response. I didn't know a lot of that stuff. Um, do you mind if I also mention one other idea that kind of connects the two? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that I think it might be a more direct way to see like how chip firing is connected to rotor routing, but doesn't get it as many of these deep connections is that if you, so you're mostly working on the case where there's just one chip on the graph and then negative one at the sink. But theoretically we could have a whole bunch of chips on the, the graph also. And if you put exactly degree many chips on a certain vertex and then do a little bit of the rotor routing process where you have the rotor spin around degree many times, what you end up with is everything goes exactly back to how it started. And you've gone from having degree chips on one vertex to having zero chips on that vertex and one chip on each adjacent vertex. So it basically, that, that's how I like to think about why this, why this rotor routing would be independent of your choice of divisor because nothing happens when you do the equivalent of a firing move. And then you can sort of think of uh, doing the rotor routing process at each step as doing like a little bit of a firing move. And my awesome. brief cartoon of, of what you were saying. <laughs> Yeah. Hopefully it's a good depiction. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so for the sake of time, we will um, say that we invite you next week to GOCC for uh, Sylvester uh, from the University of Minnesota's talk. I think the title's pending. Um, and we will cut the recording in just a little bit and then we can go to informal uh, non-recording questions and chat. But let's thank uh, one more time. Let's thank Cameron one more time. <laughs>